Well, welcome again, Calvary Chapel family. It's so good to be with you this Sunday morning. And as you know, we're, we're working our way through the book of Mark in this uh, study entitled Life with the Master. And it's our heart as pastors and staff that we as a church are going to grow close together over the next 12 weeks, not only in a close relationship with the Lord, but also with one another as his church. And as you know, Mark wrote the book of Mark because he wants to help people understand who Jesus is and understand the ministry that he came to have here on this earth. And so Mark began his gospel in the first 13 verses, showing us why Jesus is worthy to follow. And he started out saying that Jesus is the one that the prophets spoke about. Over 300 prophecy prophesied about the coming of the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled them all. And then Mark showed us that Jesus was the one that was proved through his baptism. God confirmed him. The Holy Spirit came upon him and rested on him and empowered him for ministry. And God himself cried out audibly and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, confirming that Jesus truly is the son of God, the Messiah that everyone was waiting for. And in addition, Mark wrote about how Jesus went out into the wilderness and he faced temptation and resisted the devil and he overcame evil and temptation. Jesus is the one who is worthy to follow. Well, Mark now is going to shift in the section that we're in today and he's going to show how Jesus calls out to those like us to be his disciples. Now, being a disciple is more than just making a decision. It is a work of God. It is both a call and a cost. And so Mark wants to help us see what that means this morning. Mark will show us that the life of the disciple is going to be giving up certain things, but that it's so worth it. So he's going to show us three realities of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the first reality is this. Discipleship begins with a divine calling. Discipleship is more than just making a decision. It is a divine calling of God through the work of his Holy Spirit. Verse 14 says this, it says, now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. After Jesus' baptism, he went and, and was tested out on the wilderness. And after that, instead of coming back directly to the Galilee, he actually went to the area of Judea. And he was there for over six months. While he was in Judea, John the Baptist was still in the Galilee region, baptizing people in the Jordan. Jesus, during this time in Judea, he actually went and cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. He went down to Samaria and he met a woman by a well. But it says here that after John had been taken into custody in verse 14, John the Baptist was arrested by Herod the king and and he was taken into custody, and we know eventually he was beheaded and killed. And when John was taken out of ministry, that is when Jesus came into the Galilee to begin his ministry of preaching and doing miracles. And Jesus came into the Galilee preaching, preaching the gospel of God. Jesus came to preach the good news that God has broken into space and time, has come into this earth through his son, Jesus Christ. And remember, last time I spoke about what that word gospel means. Gospel means an announcement, a proclamation. It is historic, good, and joyful news. It is news that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, has come. And the gospel also carries with it a, a royal pronouncement that the messianic king has arrived and his kingdom has come to earth. And so Jesus preached this in verse 15. It says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus come and makes a call out to people and he is offering his hearers a place in God's eternal kingdom if they will repent of their sin and believe in him as their Savior and Lord. And Christ's announcement is the time is fulfilled. Now that word time is not like time on a clock or time on a calendar. No, this is, a, is an ordained moment by God that he is breaking in to time and space. 
And he is bringing the Son of God to offer grace and salvation to all. And, and the, the gospel is a gospel call that is a divine call. Paul talks about the way that God brings salvation to mankind in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 30. Paul the Apostle says this, he says, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now Paul points to a definite order in which the blessings of salvation come to us. Long ago, before the world was even formed, God predestined that people would come to know Jesus Christ and be conformed to his image. Paul also said this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Now, Paul points to the fact that in eternity past, God divinely predestined and chose people to come to know Jesus Christ intimately, personally. And the outworking of this, God divinely calls people to be Jesus' disciples. And Paul indicates that there's a definite order in God's saving process. First, in eternity past, God predestined and chose us. Then in real time, his spirit through the preaching and teaching of God's word, he calls us. And then when we respond to that calling by faith, he justifies us. And then when we die and pass from this life, he will glorify us. Now I call this the beauty and the mystery of the gospel. There is a pursuit and a calling by God to draw them to Christ. And God will use whatever means possible, events and things in your life to kind of change things up. And then he brings the teaching and the preaching and the hearing of truth, his word, to draw us to know him. And then when we hear that and we repent of our sin and we turn to him by faith, we shall be transformed and changed. Now, now there is a tension here whether salvation is God's choice to save or man's decision to respond. And there's both. There's God's predestined work, but there's also man's responsibility and both are involved in the salvation process. Now the order is important. It always begins with God. Mankind has offended God and all the way back in the beginning in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God had every right. He was justified to annihilate mankind, but he didn't do that. Instead, he showed mercy and grace. And eventually, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the, the ultimate uh, re re revealing of God's grace. What God does and, is he sends out preachers to bring the gospel truth to people. And he motivates and, and draws people by the work of his spirit and when people hear the truth, either by the preaching of the word or through the reading of the word, and, and they, they feel this calling to come, and they recognize their sin, and they turn from their sin and repent, and they receive Christ as their Savior and Lord, salvation comes. And our choosing to repent and follow Christ, some would call that our free will. But the term free will, it lacks an understanding really of the way sin impacts our choices. Without the help of God's Holy Spirit, without the working of the details of our life of events and, and God's working of the Spirit on our heart to draw us and, and to begin to change us and, and to soften our hearts, we would never want to come to God. Randy Alcorn in his book, Hand to Hand, he wrote about what the theologian Augustine said. Augustine did not deny that fallen man has a will and that the will is capable of making choices. We are able to choose what we desire, but our desires, he says, remain chained by our evil impulses. Freedom that remains in the will will always lead to sin. True liberty can only come, he says, from without, from the work of God on the soul. 
We are totally dependent on God's grace. Boy, that's so true. This has been the debate within Christianities for centuries. But there's a, a balanced view. It's, it's not just strict determinism. No, the scripture says that, that God does not force people to believe, but that he calls people to believe. Just like Jesus when he came out and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says that God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. When the truth of the gospel is preached or either read or heard, a response of repentance and faith is required. And God, by his spirit, moves forward and empowers the word of God. And that gospel message goes out. And by his spirit, it goes out to all. But not all will respond. But those who hear the truth of God's word, and they've had their hearts softened by the work of of the Holy Spirit, and they recognize their sin and they repent of their sin, and then they respond in faith, they will be transformed and changed. This is why Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel begins with God, and he gets all the credit. It is by, faith, it is, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourself. It is the gift of God and not of works so that no one can boast. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you been called by God to be his disciple? I pray that you have because it's a divine work. You know, I remember the day that God called me to be his disciple. My wife and I had been attending a very large, we might call it a mega church for about three years and, and I liked the kind of easy messages that I heard. They made me feel comfortable and made me think of ways that I could better my life. I was comfortable with my life and I was comfortable with my lifestyle. But then I began to read God's word. I began to listen to Christian radio and, and all of a sudden in my heart things began to change. I began to be convicted by things that never convicted me before. I began to recognize in me things that I think displeased God. And then one day in, in the summer of 1991 I was in my car listening to Christian radio. I was a salesman. And I heard a message that convicted me deeply that I was a sinner before a holy God. I felt the pressure, if you will, of God that he was calling me to choose Christ. And then in a moment of space and time, I recognized that Jesus, by God's grace, was sent and he died for my sin. It was personal. And right there, I made a decision to follow Christ. It was God's calling. It was a work of his spirit but it was also a work of my responsibility, my response of faith. And at that moment, I was saved. I was transformed. God called me, and I became a disciple, a follower of Christ. Discipleship begins with a divine calling. There's a second reality we see here. Discipleship involves the cost of surrender, the cost of surrender. The gift of salvation is free. But the cost to follow Jesus includes all that we are and have. Look at verses 16 through 18 in Mark chapter 1. It says, And as he was going along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Now Jesus was a rabbi. But calling people to himself was unique. J Jewish rabbis didn't do that. What happened is pupils would come to rabbis. Th they would come to them seeking that they could follow and they would ask them if they could follow them and learn from them. But Jesus is the one. He goes out here and he is calling. And Jesus saw Andrew and Peter. Now Jesus had already met them before. Andrew had been a disciple of John the Baptist. And Andrew had heard John the Baptist see Jesus and say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew went and followed Jesus and spent a day with Jesus. And after that meeting, he went and he found his brother Peter, Simon Peter, and he brought him to Jesus as well. So they had already had a first meeting. But here, Jesus goes and seeks them out. And he commands them to follow him. When he sees them working on their nets, he says in verse 17, follow me. 
and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, Jesus' statement here is not a request. It is a command. And unlike the rabbis who usually just instructed people in the traditions of Judaism, Jesus made this very personal. He was telling them that you are to leave everything behind. And you are to come and live with me, follow me, be a part of me. Jesus says the same thing to James and John in verses 19 and 20. It says, going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went away to follow him. Jesus was calling these men to abandon the life that they knew. That meant their property, their family, their friends. Everything from this point on was to take second place and priority under Jesus. Now, we know when we read the Gospels that the disciples still had a relationship with their family. And we also know that they also did some fishing in between. But from this moment on, Jesus became the first, the priority overall. For the next three years, 24-7, they were going to be spinning all their waking moments with Jesus Christ. You see, the call to follow Christ involves both a call and a cost. You see this particularly when you look at a traditional culture like Judaism. In a traditional, in a traditional culture like this, family was absolutely the first priority. It was everything. And by Jesus telling them that they had to leave their families and to follow him, that was a really big deal. Now to us as Americans, we really don't quite understand that because we have an individualistic culture. We raise up our kids so that somewhere between 18 and 20, we're hoping that they're gonna get out of the house and they're gonna be on their way and, and kind of be able to support themselves. But that's not the case in Judaism. You know, whole family units stayed together. You had grandparents and parents and, and children together. And, and when a son would go and get a wife, he'd bring them back to the family and he'd just add on to the house. Family was everything, so this was a major call. There was a cost involved here. We get all wrapped up. It'd be kind of like if, if Jesus came to you and he called you to leave your career to follow him. You know, we in our culture, our identity is wrapped around what we do. And as Jesus was to show up at your door and say, hey, I want you to leave that and follow me, we would feel the weight of what it meant right here to follow him. You know, I remember when my older brother, Stu, uh, it was, um, he was a professional musician. And he actually had a really successful career at it. He had developed a, 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 a form of entertainment, a one-man sh show, if you will, that he became very popular in the Colorado area. He lived in Colorado Springs and the really high-end resorts and really well-known expensive restaurants would hire him to come in and do his one-man show. In his show though, he had a lot of flavorful language and maybe inappropriate material, but he had a lot of humor, he had a lot of music played and so people really liked it and he, he was booked out every year solid, had a really good career going. But then he came to know Jesus Christ and he began to follow him as his disciple. And very shortly after he came to know Jesus Christ, God began to convict him through the word of God that, that the way that he was doing his show, that there was inappropriate things that he was saying and inappropriate material that he was sharing, was sharing as a Christian. And so my brother changed the way that he did his entertaining. And in short order, those big venues stopped hiring him out. But God has been shown so much grace to my brother as he's walked with Jesus. Now he uses those gifts to worship the Lord in a church setting. You see, the families of Andrew and Peter and James and John, I think when they left to follow Jesus, I think the families thought, man, these guys have become too radicals. They've become fanatics. And maybe some of your families feel that about you, that you've become radical or become fanatics. You know, our culture is afraid of religious fanatics. It, it makes me think about the, that Korean cult recently that tried to actually spread the coronavirus in Korea. Or maybe when we think about ISIS or the Taliban, how they're just radical and they want to harm people and hurt people in the name of their religion. And so our culture is afraid of fanatics. 
So you have on, on, on one side maybe people who think, man, they're just, they're just way too serious. And, and then you have on the other side people who really don't take their faith serious at all. Either you're too zealous or you're too uncommitted. So maybe some of you would say, maybe the best way to follow Jesus is just in moderation. Listen to what Pastor Tim Keller says. He asked the question, well, can't we be in the middle with Jesus? I mean, moderation in all things. You know, not too zealous and not too committed. You know, being right in the middle would be just right. So is this the way Christianity works? The answer to that question to what Pastor Keller said is absolutely not. Jesus never taught moderation. Jesus always taught an all-out passion for Christ. Listen to Jesus' response to the church of Laodicea in Revelations chapter 3. You might call them a church of moderation. Jesus says this in Revelation 3, 15 and 16. He says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus does not want a disciple of moderation. Jesus wants a disciple of passion, where he is first, where he is the first love and passion of our life. Listen to what Jesus says about following him as a disciple in Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus says first that anyone can be his disciple. There are no race barriers in Christianity or gender barriers or culture barriers no, the gospel is open to all. Anyone can become a disciple of Christ. But to follow Christ, there is a cost. Jesus wants people who are all in, fully committed. Jesus is not calling people to hate their family here. He is calling disciples to follow him so intensely, so completely, that when people... Um, see any other attachment, it looks actually like hatred. Is there anything in your life that has taken first place over following Jesus Christ, over your commitment to him to be a disciple? If your commitment to Christ is dependent on something else to happen, then there's something going on with your walk with Jesus. If you say, I will follow Jesus if he gives me good health, or I will follow Jesus if he blesses my business, or I will follow Jesus if he makes my family strong. Anything after that if statement has taken first place in your life. You know, Jesus wants to be first, that your passion and your love is first for him. Now, does that kind of commitment sound like fanaticism to you? It's not if you understand the, distant, the difference between the gospel and religion. You see, religion is, a, is advice on how you can earn God's favor. Religion is advice on how you can do certain things so that God will be pleased with your life. But the problem with that is when you have that kind of an attitude that I do these things to please God, you begin to look down on people that don't do those things. Again, Pastor Tim Keller says this. He says, religion makes you feel superior to others and you stay away from them and exclude them from your life. And eventually you'll hate them and even oppress them. And there are some Christians like that, not because they've gone too far and been too committed to Jesus, but because they haven't gone far enough. They're treating Christianity as advice instead of good news. The gospel is not advice. The gospel is good news that you don't need to earn your way to heaven, but Christ came and he fulfilled everything that needed to be done and he offers you a relationship with God freely as a gift. It is a gift of his grace. And when you have embraced that gift and received Christ, 
there is a passion that is put in you by the Holy Spirit and a love for Christ that you will leave everything behind to follow him. Just like we saw here with the disciples, Andrew and Peter and James and John. Right now, I want you to, to look at this video that's about to be played and, and see someone who surrendered all to Christ. Her name is Jackie Hill Perry. Let's watch. My childhood was, I don't want to say typical, but I think typical to those growing up in black communities. Dad was pretty much inconsistent. I saw him maybe every few years. He would just pop in, be in my life for six months, and then pop back out and just show up whenever he felt like it. My mother worked every weekend, so I would spend Sundays with my aunt, who was a Christian. Um, and so she would take me to church with her like every single Sunday, which was incredibly boring, but I enjoyed the popcorn that the kids got and the Skittles. Childhood was a mixture of abandonment, but not knowing that's what that was, mixed with glimpses of God through my aunt, mixed with seeing my mother work hard. I think middle school and high school was me chasing after love from people. I wanted people to tell me that I'm something, that I'm significant, that I'm somebody. And women, I think, uh, became one of the main sources of that for me. I was confused. I didn't know what to do. I had these feelings that seemed very natural, these thoughts that seemed super normal to me, but I knew it wasn't normal to culture. I grew up in black church. That's like a no-no <laughs> is to be gay. And so it was projected all the time that this is not okay, but I had read the scriptures pertaining to it being a sin. And so I just believed it. I didn't try to talk myself out of it because to me, I felt like what I read in the scriptures was correlating with the conviction I felt. This feeling correlates with what this is saying. <laughs> it's like, it's not an isolated situation, but I still didn't know how to come to terms with this is how I feel. So I'm gonna do it. The things I knew about scripture, it seemed like they just would not get out of my head. It was just like, God is everywhere. And it was just getting on my nerves. I don't wanna be a Christian. I don't wanna be saved. Because what I thought Christianity to be was people that just didn't do stuff. You don't listen to secular music, you wear long dresses, you go to church all the time, and you don't curse. If that's what Christianity is, I'm cool on that. I already didn't have peace, but the reminder of the truth was increasing my awareness of my lack of peace. And so I called uh, one of my cousins who was a believer, and she was like, you know what? I believe that God is going to show you how much you need him. I'm like, okay, whatever. I think over the course of some months, that's when I got arrested. My dad ended up passing away from a motorcycle accident, which really broke me because it was kind of like this realization that we'll never talk. From there, me and my mother's relationship was just like, we were not close, we were not cool. It was like everything I was doing, my entire life became uncomfortable. It became isolated, it became just lonely. When I was 19 and feeling God speak to my heart and tell me what you're doing will be the death of you. Like this is not an idea anymore that sin will kill me. It's not an idea anymore that God is not pleased with this. Like this is reality and I have to deal with it today. When I reckoned with that, I knew that I could not save myself. I knew I could not walk away from these things because I enjoyed them way too much. And so I knew from Bible study at church when I was five, you die for people like me. You said you'll forgive people like me. And so I'll just believe that. I was in a church in two weeks wearing girl clothes in a week. That was strange. I wasn't used to wearing regular bras and I had to understand how to sit like a woman again because I was used to sitting like a guy. Just relearning womanness. He did what he had to do to grab me because I would not have chose God apart from God choosing me. Now that's an amazing testimony that Jackie Hill Perry gave on that video. But I want to share a few things that she shared in an interview with Christianity Today about her conversion experience. She said, shortly after that pivotal night of surrendering my life to Christ, I did the painful work of breaking up with my girlfriend. Her tears were too loud to listen to without regret. To leave her made no sense apart from the divine work of God. She was both my woman and my idol. 
She was the eye that Jesus said to gouge out and the right hand that he commanded me to cut off. And though it was painful in the extreme, it was like removing a part of my body. It was better for me to lose her than to lose my soul. I told her, I just gotta live for God now. And then I hung up the phone. And I had no idea what would come next or how I'd have the power to re resist everything that I'd live for. But I knew that if Jesus is God, and if God is mighty to save, then God will be mighty to keep me. And 10 years later now, he has kept this girl godly. I don't know if you know this, but Jackie Hill Perry now is married and she has two children. And she is serving the Lord as his disciple. But she understood that the moment that Jesus called her, that it was a call of surrender. And she surrendered all just like the disciples did when they left their nets. And that's the call for us. There's a cost to surrender. So discipleship begins with the divine calling. And discipleship involves the cost of surrender. And there's a third reality that we see. Discipleship has a purpose. There's a call and a cost. But there's definitely a purpose in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 17 again. It says, and Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, Jesus walked up to these Caesar, seasoned fishermen, and, and he calls them to follow him. He calls them to leave everything and surrender. But guys, that call and that surrender, it has a purpose. And, and we're going to take a look at three of them. Now, there's a lot of different purposes, but I see three that are spoken of here in this text. And the first purpose of, for a disciple of Christ, it is to know Christ relationally, to know him relationally. As disciples, we are to have a living relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. Being a disciple of Jesus is not religion where we just do stuff for God to earn his favor. No, it is about knowing Christ and it is about knowing him intimately these men, when they left their nets for the next three years, 24-7, they did life with Jesus. But it was a lot more than just kind of a teacher-pupil relationship. It was that. He was their master. He was their Lord. He was their teacher. But also, guys, he was their friend. Listen to what Jesus said shortly before he went to the cross to his disciples in John chapter 15, verses 13 through 15. He says, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call, call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Friendship speaks of intimacy. It speaks of relationship. And this is where we begin. Jesus said, follow me. He's speaking about a relationship with him. It's personal. It's intimate. And when, try, and when Christ called you out of the life that you were living, and he called you into the kingdom of God, guys, it was a kingdom of relationship with him. The life of a disciple is a personal walk with Jesus. It starts at conversion and it goes for the rest of our lives until we die and we're with him in glory. So that's the first purpose is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's a second purpose. A disciple comes to know others relationally as well. Guys, we are to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but also we are to do it in community in relationship with others. Um, he said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. That word you there collectively is all the disciples. You kind of had this band of brothers that they became a tight-knit group. They got to know each other well in relationship. And then it began to grow. Others began to, to become part of that community, both men and women. And we see this after Jesus had resurrected from the grave and ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. It says, when they entered the city, 
They went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas, the, Judas, the son of James. And they all, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, his brothers. You had both men and, wa- and women gathered together in that upper room. You had even Jesus' own family, Mary and his brothers. You had this community. And this community had been together a long time. They had developed relationships of drawing together. They were believers in Christ. They had this personal relationship. But they also had personal relationships with others. You know, that's why we're doing what we're doing here with these small groups through the summer. You know, we wanted people, we wanted to take this opportunity to gather people together that we would walk with Jesus, yes, in relationship to him, but yes, in relationship to one another. And that's our heart, that you guys, as you're gathering together in your groups, will have these deep relationships develop and blossom, and and you'll do life together with Christ. And this is exactly what the church was in the first century. They did life together. They worshiped together, they prayed together, they had fellowship together, they had meals together. We see this in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And also uh, 44, it says, So then, those who had received his words were baptized, and that day they were added uh, 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And all those who had believed together and they all had all things in common. This, this word says they had all things in common. It speaks about the unity of the church body, but it also speaks about the, the relationships that had developed in the church. It was the one another's. They were blessing to one another. So two purposes we've seen a relationship with Jesus and a relationship with others. But the third purpose is we are to make Christ known. We are called as his disciples to not only be with others in a church community, but we are to bring out the gospel message. Look at verse 17 again. He says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. For those who came to know and love Jesus Christ, there was a passion that was stirred in them that they just couldn't contain themselves. And they wanted to go out and help people to know Jesus. Our purpose as a disciple is to know Christ and to make his, him known. Now we see this, this is what Jesus gave to the disciples as a commission right before he went to the cross. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said this to his disciples. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to reach out past our comfort zone and to make disciples. And what that means is when a person comes to faith in Christ, we are to come around them and we are to begin to live life with them. Yes, we are to spend time with them in in worship and praise and prayer, but also life stuff. Living with them, knowing them, being a part of their life, doing life as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And guys, this is the sweetest part of Christianity, is being a disciple maker, helping them to understand his word, but also understand what it means to live it out. You know, I, I, I experienced this when I was a missionary in England with Pastor Bill Foote. And we were church planters and we were planning a church that. And so there was a lot of ministry that Bill and I did together. We spent time in prayer together. We spent time doing church services together. We witnessed together on the streets in England. But we also did a lot of life together. We had our families together. We had meals together. And all of it was part of the discipleship process. Bill was discipling me, if you will. He was making me a disciple, helping me to grow in my walk. But not only that, we're also called to be witnesses. And Jesus, right before he has ascended to heaven, he said this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Each of us as a disciple of Christ, we are called 
to go out and to preach the gospel. That is to share Jesus with others. We're to be a witness. Now, simplified being a witness really is just to be a witness of what Jesus is doing in our life. And it takes more than just our life. It also takes words. And, and what, what Jesus did there is he kind of lays concentric circles going out. And first it was their hometown. For us, we could see that as our family. He said, we're to be if you will, witnesses in Jerusalem. Guys, our Jerusalem would be our families, those that we have close relationship with. And then he says, go to Judea. That for us could be friends and workmates, reaching out to those that, that we work with or those that we have relationships with as friends. Then he says, go to Samaria. That could be basically acquaintances. It could even be our enemies, but be willing to move out bringing the gospel. And lastly, he says we're to go to the remotest parts of the earth. For us, that could be strangers. People we don't really know, but we run into them, and God opens an opportunity uh, for us to share. Being a disciple of Christ is a wonderful thing. And, and what we see here is, just in that little verse, there are three purposes that he showed us. To know Christ intimately, to know others relationally, and to make him known. And this idea of, of making him known, it reminds me of a story that I recently read from a pastor who, who was a pastor of a large mega church. And, and he wrote about that uh, he had preached what it meant to be a disciple and he had received an email from a woman. This is what he said. He, he said, I re received an email from a lady who asked me to pray for her because she wanted to take seriously the challenge to follow Jesus and be his disciple. And though she had worked in a small office for around seven years, no one knew that she was a Christian. And she even had a good friend in the office, a workmate right next to her. And that person didn't even know that she went to church. And so she made a decision. She decided she was going to tell her friend in her office that she was a Christian. And the pastor said that, that he... Uh, hadn't heard anything from her, and so he wrote her an email, and this is what he said. He said, a few weeks later, I received an email, and this is what she wrote. She wrote back saying that it was really embarrassing and convicting moment for both of them. I guess what happened is she went to her workmate friend, and, and she asked her if she'd come to church with her to the next Sunday church meeting, and the friend started to laugh and said, I go to that same church, and they kind of had a laugh together, and then they both felt guilty together. They had known each other for seven years and neither one of them had shared that they were a disciple of Jesus Christ. He wasn't first in their workplace. I pray that's not us. Let us, as Jesus' disciples, follow him. And we see three things, three realities of what that means to be a disciple. Discipleship begins with a divine calling. Discipleship involves the cost of surrender, and discipleship has a purpose. I pray you see these realities in your life. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for the word of God, and we turn our hearts to you now. Lord, help us to live for you. Help us to live as disciples of Jesus in a close relationship with you, Lord, in close relationship with others, and help us, Lord, to make you known, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.